Hello and welcome to Irish Football Fan TV and this is this week's version of the League of Ireland show. We've been away for a couple of weeks with it but we're back now uh, joined by Josh today and we're going to discuss the first half of the league season and also the big news story of the last couple of weeks in the League of Ireland which is of course Cork City's 16 goal striker Sean Maguire has agreed to join Preston North End in England in the Championship to join Alan Brown and Daryl Horgan and Andy Boyle and Aidan McGeady there to you know compete the Irish with it's Greg Cunningham there as well, actually. There's a fair yeah. few Irish players of Preston now. It's getting a little bit excessive with the amount of ones at Burnley, too. That little corner of Lancashire has gone, gone a bit mad, hasn't it? <laughs> but, um, yeah, Sean McGuire, um, great first half of the season for Cork. Great last season for Cork as well. And now he gets his move back over to England to the Championship. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, look, uh, Cork are the top scorers in the league by, by a fair whack. And then you look at the amount of Cork. Goals Maguire scored, he scored 16 out of 48. Yeah. A third, halfway through the season. It's it's ridiculous. I think it's probably unsurmounted as well in the league in, in the time I've been watching it anyway. Yeah, in recent years, I think the only striker who you could really kind of say match these heights in terms of goal scoring is Gary Twig at Rovers. When he was there those seasons, because obviously Twig went into the 20s and every season he was at Rovers, so he was kind of the last real goal scoring striker. Obviously, you've had a lot of people talk about. David Millen last year and stuff like that when he was <coughs> getting a few goals in Europe and stuff for Dundalk. But yeah, hoping to in 2015. Yeah. Um, but he's not... McMillan's really not ever been a 20-goal-a-season striker. Pat Hoban wasn't even really a 20-goal-a-season striker and you see that now. He's kind of sitting on the bench for Mansfield in the league too. He's yeah. not really um, not really kicked on since he went to England and I think you need to be this prolific type of striker to maybe make it in the Championship. Um, how do you think, obviously Maguire's been there before and he was over with West Ham and he was on loan at Accrington as well in League 2. Yeah. Um, the Championship is a big step up from uh, the Premier Division over here. Like You look at Daryl Horgan and Andy Boyle, obviously they've both played for Preston. They're not exactly sitting in their reserve team. They're both players who are consistently in their 18. Yeah. But neither of them have really set the world alight since they went over there. Horgan's had a couple of decent performances. Boyle has had a couple of solid ones when he's come into the centre of defence but I have to say I, I think it's a bit of a big step up for Maguire even when he's in such big or such good form the last year or so yeah I think we spoke about it yesterday in SL just having yeah. a cup of coffee or whatever and how important confidence is going to be for him going in yeah um, as you said as you said yourself if, if he's going in full of confidence um, and he feeds on and he has, a, he has a decent last whatever it's going to be four or five weeks with Cork yeah and he's going into a fly and then he has a chance if he's going into in a bit of a flat spell and he only scores another two or three goals, going in, oh, can I do it here, can I not? If he's not fully 100% with himself, yeah, then I agree with you, I think it's a struggle. Yeah, I think if he was to, say, break the 20-goal mark for this season before he was, before he left, um, and he also kind of, I think, maybe scored in Europe for them as well. I know he's probably only going to get to play one round of Europe before he goes, but... If he was get a goal in Europe as well, I think that might give him that little bit of confidence too. That when he scores in Europe too, and now he's moving to the Championship, he's really on like the cusp of being in that Ireland squad, and I think that's important for him as well. I think that's probably the biggest factor in moving to Preston yeah. would be to get into the Ireland squad. Obviously, <laughs> um, had Martin O'Neill and Roy Keane watching him on Friday up in Dundalk when he got the hat trick. Yeah. So I talked about it with Paul when we were talking about Ireland. Um that's he's probably a different option to anything we have and do you think if he does go out with confidence we speak about and he does you know um get in front of Jordan Hugel to get in the squad or get into the press and starting lineup do you think then he just becomes a certainty to be in the Ireland squad he should do um, I mean look it's it's never easy to go and second guess Martin O'Neill in a, in a small way he's a little bit like Trapatown he, he sticks with the tried and trusted again we know this weekend it's what Walters, Murphy and McGoldrick in the squad. Yeah. Um and to be honest, maybe Barr, Jonathan Walters need to now play a lot of football this year. And we know how well Killian Sheridan's yeah. done in Poland, we know how well Sean McGuire's done in the League of Ireland yet again he, he they've still not got a look in but in saying that I do think if, if he goes to press and does well and is up there in the top scorer list in, in the championship then yes, Mark O'Neill has to pick him. Yeah, I think if you're going to be picking strikers like a McGoldrick, who's not really scoring goals in the championship, 
if Maguire is doing the same thing, like similar enough in the championship, he definitely has to be in the squad because he's so different. And he's so different to kind of anything else we have in the squad, really. Sean, he's more of a, he can dribble with the ball a bit. He's a goal scorer. He'll work as well, though. Yeah, he will. Yeah. And he's, he has that natural instinct for goal. And he's shown that before he left for England and since he's come back, he does have a natural instinct in the box to put the ball away and he's a good finisher. And that's something that, as me and Paul talked about on the Ireland video, which I'm going to continue to plug, it's on the channel as well. Um, we don't really have another natural finisher within the squad or really within kind of Irish football. Was, still, yeah. yeah, like Scott Hogan has had a good season and a half at Brentford and then been really quiet since he went to Villa. We still don't know if he's going to declare for Ireland. He's a natural enough finisher, but he can't stay fit. So, I think Maguire being a success at Preston is actually vital for Ireland going forward as much as it is for him on a personal level. Yeah. Um. But, anyway, we're going to move on now to actually talking about the league and not talking about the player who's leaving. And the championship. Yeah, and the championship <laughs> as well. But um, And Ireland a little bit. We'll actually move on to what the League of Ireland show is about. And that is, obviously, the League of Ireland and the Premier Division we're going to speak about today. And we're halfway through the season now. Yeah. It's been utter domination from Cork. 18 points clear at the top of the league after, what, 17 games? It's kind of outrageous. You're halfway through the season and they're 18 points clear. Um. Dundalk at their best weren't even this good, were they? No, no, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen a side that just don't look like slipping up. I mean, yeah, they're just so solid in every department. I mean, um, Greg Bulger, who was captain for us last year, can't get in the team anymore. Yeah, um, you've, you've got players like Gary Buckley, Gerard Morris playing out of their skin, Carl Shepard playing out of position. It's probably been it's probably the second, third best player in the league. Carl Shepard looks like the Carl Shepherd of Rovers before he left to go to Reading. Yeah, but he doesn't he even care that, that he's playing out position. Yeah. He doesn't even care. Yeah. That's the kind of, I think that speaks to the mentality John Caulfield has instilled within the squad that Sheps is a lad. He's been around the league for a while. He scored goals for Rovers. He scored goals for Galway. He's a very good striker. We all know he is. And he's playing him kind of out wide and he doesn't seem to be complaining. He seems to be, you know, thriving. Um, playing out of position and maybe with Maguire going maybe Shepherds the one he moves into the middle for them and starts yeah. to play through the middle in the second half of the season I think they're going to be kicking themselves and obviously he scored in the last round of games before um, the break uh, Shijani Ogbeni yeah. so who gone. left to Limerick, yeah, Limerick yeah. I think if he hadn't left now that's perfect that Ogbeni would come into the side and Shepherd would move through the middle and that would be my one worry for Cork, or for Cork going into the second half of the season is they're solid at the back. They've conceded eight goals this season. Yeah. Like, that's ludicrous for any team in any division to only yeah. concede that many goals. That's Chelsea with Terry and Carvalho that first season yeah. levels where they only conceded 15 goals but in the entire there, season. There might be a worry in as well as uh, Sean Maguire obviously going. Um, the future Ryan Delaney still hasn't been sorted out. Yeah. And he's been probably the main reason alongside John Dunleavy, of course, their captain. That yeah. they've conceded so few goals this year. I mean, that's going to be sorted out in the next kind of two or three weeks, I think they're saying. But as well as the league, it could be, could be vital for them when Europe comes around. Yeah. Um, and you look through their squad and you look at probably the resources they have money wise, they wouldn't really be able to replace him. No. If he wasn't there. And he has come into that side and really just taken over the mantle as like the leader in that back four. Obviously. From Murray, obviously. Yeah, from Murray. And obviously. Um, to leave his captain and everything, but he's not right in the heart of it. And you need someone right in the heart of it to be that leader if you're going to be really solid defensively. And he's really picked that up, and he's a quality footballer on top of that. Um, you even then look on the left as well, Kevin O'Connor, the left back, yeah. who is a phenomenal, he is a phenomenal talent, and they need to try and keep hold of him as well. And I think this is what happens with League of Ireland clubs. Um, as it goes on, that's... The more successful they are, the more likely they are to lose their best players because players don't want to stay in Ireland for their career if they're good enough to go somewhere else. Yeah, especially and after last year with, with Dundalk being on the European stage and stuff. And you know, this year I think that like scouts and stuff from the from the from the Premier League Championship League One will will be looking at Irish sides a little bit more fruitfully this year. Yeah, like I know when Paul Cook's in charge of Portsmouth, he actually had a guy over here watching the league every week scouting players mm -hmm. to see what level like what level of talent there was and 
what players there is because it's so cheap. Sean McGuire has gone for what, 150,000? Yeah, I think there's a release class in the contract. Yeah, yeah which is nothing. Mm-hmm. Like, it's genuinely nothing when you look at, you know, what some of the fees that players are signing for and even League One and the bot men of the championship now that you can sign a player <coughs> who you feel can compete in a championship club for 150,000 from over here. And I think that's something the league needs to sort out as a whole. 150k release clause just isn't enough for a player who Cork knew Sean McGuire was going to, you know, at some point the confidence was going to come back and the ability was going to come back because he was so young that he was going to find his form again. Yeah. And I think that was a administrative error from Cork to leave that release clause in if that should have gone so they could bargain it for themselves and get a little bit more out of it. Yeah, it's probably a conversation for another day, but yeah. it could have been it could have been something that made you, made him sign the new contract at the end of last season. Yeah, possibly. But um, we'll move on then to last year's champions and the year before champions. Year before champions. <laughs> um, and I think every Shamrock Rovers fan out there is delighted that Dundalk are on top of the table and are a bit off because they can continue to sing <laughs> right. four in a row. Um, but it's been a very stop-start season for Dundalk. Obviously, they lost Andy Boyle and they lost Daryl Horgan. But... They've kind of seemed to, as the season has progressed so far, or this year, as it's gone on, they've started to look a much more... Difficult for Dundalk, starting off, I mean, two years ago they had Tell, last yeah. year they had Horgan, who was their standout player, and this year it's, it's, ju- it's just taken a while, I mean, you can, you're can kind of seeing uh, Jamie McGrath and Robbie Benson starting to um, climb up to that mantle to be the real controller yeah. of the team, Michael Duffy as well has come in, he's starting to come into a little bit of form, but... It's it's been difficult and it's it's clearly been a transitioning period for Stephen Kenny's side and that's the first one since he's come in. Yeah, um, for sure. Like obviously he had when he came in, he came into nothing, so he didn't have to go through a transitional phase where he had to work with kind of half a squad that was there and all right, well we'll yeah. use these. He kind of kicked out the vast majority of that yeah. squad because they were nowhere near good enough. He kept and... John Mountain and built nothing. nothing yeah, and pretty, much. pretty much. He he built a squad around John Mountain. Let's yeah. put it that way. <laughs> Business a little bit. Um, but yeah, a hundred percent. Like it's the first time he's had to go through a bit of adversity, I guess, as Dundalk manager because yeah. it's just all been rousy till now, and he's lost. He lost Tell, but. I guess Tell probably wasn't that big of a loss because he did have players to replace him, yeah. and he had Horgan to take over the mantle and. Horgan's obviously a big loss, but I think the biggest loss for them, without doubt, has been Andy Boyle. Yeah, I think losing your the heart of your defense, and probably the heart of your football team as well, in Boyle is just absolutely vital. It's probably not uh, helped that Gartland's been in and out with injuries as well. Yeah, because you, you've had the likes of uh, Nicholas Emlund and Sean Hoare trying to fit into the team, but really they haven't had much of a chance because they haven't really they haven't they haven't had the opportunity to play with Gartland consistently, and of course Boyle being on as well, they just haven't had a chance to play with that solid figure that's been there through all the success. Yeah, exactly. I think and losing the heart of your defence is probably more disruptive to a football team than losing your left-sided midfielder because Jamie McGrath's come in and Jamie McGrath's looked quite good. Yeah. Um, I think he came in and you looked at him and went, is he really ready to take over Daryl Horn? Maybe they're just going to, between him, McElhenney and Duffy, they're kind of all going to pitch together and have the impact that Daryl Horgan had. But Jamie McGrath's shown signs of becoming that player for Dundalk who was just absolutely vital to them um, and obviously David Millen has still scored 9 goals in the league this year mm-hmm. which isn't exactly bad is it No. Um, for a striker who's not really a known goal scorer double figures after what 17 games yeah and sorry, nearly, obviously one away obviously double nearly figures. double figures yeah um, and I'm sure he'll hit that in the first 2 or 3 games of the, of the second half of the season but yeah he's, do, he's done really well and again it's probably been a tough a tough period for Dave as well because he's had to adapt he's he's been used to a lot of decent service obviously from Daryl Horgan then you take that away and you've got to learn to play with someone else like Duffy I know he might be a similar player but he'll still be a little bit different Yeah. Um. so it's been difficult for him as well but I'm sure he'll kick on the second half of the season yeah 100% um, we'll move on to Derry then who obviously and a season that's going to be completely overshadowed for a couple of reasons obviously the biggest one being losing Roy McBride um, in such tragic circumstances and They've kind of on the pitch really struggled to find consistent form since then, and we talked about the last show that we did about the fact that even like losing your captain and losing a good friend to a lot of the players and the guys vital around the club and everything is a massive thing, and it's um obviously going to be the biggest impact. But you're also losing your first choice centre half, and you're losing maybe the best player in your team. So if it'll still be up in third place, I think that's a 
really big achievement for them, especially when they're not even playing their games in Derry. Yeah, the three points off second as well. Still. Yeah, it could have been, and they maybe it should have been a, a very special season for the for the Derry folk up there. Again, moving away from their own home wasn't easy either. But yeah, have they suffered a defeat before? Um, for the the tragedy, I'm not sure, but. Uh, I don't think they actually. I know they were unbeaten when um, Ryan passed away. It could have been. It could have been uh, an amazing title race if that now happened. Yeah, one hundred percent. It could have been Derry. Derry have the ability to be right up there because I think in Barry McNamee and especially Aaron McAniff, yeah, they have two of the brightest talents in the league. I think McAniff is just for me. He's probably the best central midfielder in the league, uh, genuinely. Um, I think probably from out and out now, Central yeah. Yeah, I think he's that good. Um, yeah. and I I don't think he's long for Derry. I think he'll probably end up in England pretty soon because he's that type of footballer. Um, in terms of his ability and his style of play, I think he's perfect for a League One club or a Championship club to move in there and kind of move up. But Derry are gonna have him the rest of the season, and I think with him and McNamee and stuff, and you know their back four is starting to come together a bit more, and they look a bit more solid. Um. I think in that second half of the season they could kind of push on and challenge Dundalk for that second spot. Like they've drawn seven games this year, which has really disrupted them. You look at that if they turn a couple of them into wins, they're right up. You know they're right up past Dundalk, and they wouldn't be that far away from Cork if they could just hold on to games and maybe have someone to score a few more goals. Like McNamee and McInniff are their two top scorers. And Harrison's been out for a while as well. Yeah, you know, and surely he can't be that far away. Yeah, exactly. Gavin and Rory back for the second half of the season. I think it's going to be really, really big for Derry. But uh, we'll move on to this season's surprise package then. And that's, I suppose, a surprise package if you just look at the, if you're to just look at the league table and look at the names on it. Yeah. But yeah, I think Bray have been Bray have just been really, really good. They've been a bit leaky at the back, but in terms of attack, they've been absolutely outstanding. Obviously, Gary McCabe is. 13 goals this season so what what have you made of Bray and everything they've done because it was something that was either going to go this way or it was going to go horribly horribly wrong like so many of these projects in the league around dude yeah it's 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 fairly interesting with Bray I think looking at um, predictions at the start of the season a lot of people did have them in their top four and that and they've done really well up to now but the last couple of weeks the wheels have started to come off maybe a little bit yeah they were poor against Rovers the second yeah. last game of the season obviously conceded five down in Limerick um, but it's been I think if you're a Bray fan it's been a great first half yeah, of the right, season yeah, and, yeah. yeah not, even if look if they weren't finishing Europe now and they're finished maybe sixth or so and have a good run in the FAI Cup or whatever I think that's a successful first season if they keep that group together they are a club who look like they're going to stay around they look like they are pretty financially stable from everything I've heard behind the scenes as well. Players are getting paid and everything like that, which is a good thing, which is a start <laughs> for most <laughs> League of Ireland clubs. So that doesn't always happen. Um, yeah, that they're a team who are going to really stick around, and um, I'm sure we'll talk about them a lot more in the second half of the season um, yeah. about being a team who are going to be right up there. But we'll move on to Ireland's biggest club. Well, what people say is Ireland's biggest club anyway. Um, Shamrock Rovers, who fifth position... Great at home, horrendous away from home, and have had six red cards in the league this season. Um, it's been a very up and down season for Rovers so far, hasn't it? Yeah, I think it's nearly been more of the same, really. <laughs> yeah, it's losing to the top clubs and beating yeah. the teams at the bottom and not beating Pats, regardless of what they try and do. Um, so they've beaten Pats twice in Pats five years now. Pats come out there in the clouds, and let's be honest. Yeah, you'd like probably still draw 1-1. One, one. Um <laughs> But top score, like the top scorers, obviously been Burke, Milan, and Shaw, all with five goals. All three of them linking together, um, in that front four with Trevor Clark now on the left. But is Rovers' biggest problem that they're in discipline? Because obviously, last game before the break against Pats, a one all draw. Rovers are flying and superb first half. Milan and Burke look phenomenal together. The entire first half, they just looked like they're ripping Pats apart. Rovers look a bit frustrated to start of the second half, sat a bit too deep. Then all of a sudden, Graham Burkle is ahead and kick someone for the second time in that match as well, to be fair. He'd already got a yellow card in the first half for kicking someone and then kicked out again at Michael Barker to get the red card. Is that the biggest problem for Rovers? Just that they're a bit inexperienced and a bit indisciplined? That's one problem. Um, 
yeah, I think that probably should have been picked out and should have never happened again. <coughs> yeah. After the after the the the, the game with Brick, it was like that. That was poor. That was shocking. Was yeah, no, especially was, on your debut. There was no defending that, and effort to go and happen again. But what gets me is uh, just excuses. Yeah. And like when you go to you go to get you go into Cork, Trevor Clark scores a fantastic goal, fair enough. Yeah. And Robert's going to lose four one. And Stephen Bradley still says that Cork would not be the same team without Sean McGuire when they just beat them for one. Yeah, I oh, know. I just don't agree with that. And surely that gives the, that not so much a bad vibe to the players, but surely that gives them a little bit like so we can take the foot off the gas a little bit. It'll be alright. Well, I don't think it's even that they can take the foot off the gas. It's I think he's he seems to to an extent be building up like and being an upper group of players who have proved nothing in this league, like and. You know, just before I get pelted for it, I'm a Rovers fan, and like I've watched through bad times before Tala, and I've seen the great teams under Mick O'Neill, who, you know, maybe not on the field of football wise, but in terms of results were brilliant. Um, and since then, it's kind of been like this constantly, yeah. it's just been this over and over again. And I just I see Stephen Bradley's excuses and I see a young team and I see a team devoid of leaders. To me, I see a team full of good footballers. Um, to be fair to them, there's not a lot of players in there who you go, oh, they can't play. Like They're, they're a good team of players, but Ronan Finn's a superb footballer. He's not a captain. Um, and you look throughout the rest of that team and you look throughout the rest of that squad and you look, where's the leaders? Where's the experienced League of Ireland heads who have been there and done that apart from Finn? Like, there, there just isn't. There just isn't another player within that squad. Roberto Lopez has obviously had a couple of good years at Bow. Simon Madden's been around forever, but probably not won that much for the talent of the player he is. Luke Byrne is a young player. Dave Webster was a brave for years before he was at Rovers, so he wasn't exactly setting the world alight. Poor and Bray. <laughs> just, I know we're above us in league, but just take shots at them. Um... And then apart from that, it's a lot of lads who are young and just kind of only coming into the league, really, and finding their feet in it. And I think Bradley just needs to stop making excuses and actually, you know, get his team to start playing with a bit more steel about them. Um, The final team we're going to talk about then in today's video is Limerick. And we're going to do the um bottom six. Not No, we're not grouping them all in relegation together, but um, it's quite tight down there. So we're kind of going to do all of them as a second separate video that you're going to see soon on the channel. So stay, you know, stay tuned for that. But um, Limerick, it's been quite a quite a weird season. Obviously, you know, Martin Russell leaving and you, you've obviously worked with Martin before. You know the type of character he is. It's not the most surprising thing you've ever seen. But um, he's quite loyal, and it did surprise me a little bit when he left. But Limerick season as a whole, it's been quite decent for a side. You look at the squad and you go, we're really sure what to expect. Yeah, no, like, again, they, they dominated the, the the first division last year, and everyone had the same thoughts coming back at Limerick. probably be kind of top six and that. <laughs> That's where they are in the mid-season break. They, they're, they're six, so they've yeah. done quite well. Martin reinforced Martin reinforced the team quite well, bringing in Rodrigo Tassi, Dean Clark, and that, and they've added like Benny as well. Yeah, and be huge signing from from them. Cork, yeah. and I'd say that like, Cork have had a fantastic start this season, but I'd say they'll be they'll, they'll they'll be a better team with Al yeah. Benny in the squad. Like that's the better thing. depth anyway. Yeah, um, I think Tassi has been the standout signing for probably any team in the league this year. Mm. Um, more or less, yeah. He's been for a player they have just. A Brazilian striker they've plucked from obscurity somewhere in Asia. Um, he's superb. He's a natural goal scorer and he's a decent player with the ball on his feet and stuff as well. And I think going forward in the second half of the season, to keep hold of him and keep him scoring goals. And they're going to be a team who maybe pushes the top three. Obviously, they're only a point behind or three points behind Rovers at the minute, so they're a little bit away from the top three, but. Any team goes in a run of games when you're only that far behind, then you're going to be there or thereabouts, aren't you? Yeah, and uh, again, I think we spoke about one of the other teams that Bray, I think, was a uh, decent cup run. Uh, yeah. did, uh, a striker that's firing up front, great recipe. And I think I think this year with Cork going so well in the league, I think the, the FAI Cup is really up for grabs. Yeah, and do you think McDonald's going to strengthen it all? And some, you know? 
Yeah, it'd be interesting. Obviously, too. with course be, obviously have, coming from England, yeah, and of course he'll have contacts. Yeah, he's gonna have a lot of contacts, a lot of lower league players that he can kind of have a look at. And yeah, I think he might actually see one or two come in at Limerick and him kind of put his own stamp on it because obviously it's not his squad. Yeah, I like, look, they have they have a good basis. Um, again, the team that won the first division last year, uh, Tossy that we spoke about, Dean Clark. But again, I'd say a, a couple of players in and around that that have played in Scotland, the lower leagues, England definitely can't hurt Limerick. Yeah, one hundred percent. Um, anyway. We are going to leave it there today. That's the top six from the Premier Division so far this season. Um, next video will be on the bottom six and the team's battling relegation. So, Pats fans, look out for that. Um, but that's it for today. Cheers for watching. Make sure to like, share and subscribe. And we'll see you again soon.